Okay, here we go. One, two. There you go, folks. Dr. Jazz, written by Joe King Oliver in 1926. Now, that song was written, what, is that about 93 years ago? It's still being played. As a matter of fact, yesterday, I got a Dixieland band together, and we played this at a restaurant. They were featuring the Kentucky Derby. We played that song yesterday. Dr. Jazz, just imagine. It's still being played today, and that is a mark of a good song. Now, where the hell do you go on the internet or TV and want to listen to an interview about some subject that you have interest in? And as a matter of fact, more and more people are getting interested in. And the interviewer comes on, picks up a 100-year-old horn, and plays a song that's 90 <laughs> years old. That's what I call cultural enrichment. You only get it here. That is life after Scientology. And I'm your host, Ron Miscavige. And we have a special guest on for you today. Let me put my horn away right now. And this person is an old friend of mine. I mean, old friend. And is very knowledgeable. And you enjoy her as well as I do. And I'm not going to say much except any of you who would like to contribute to this show, you can become a Patreon Go to my website, The Real Ron Miscavige, and it will show you how to join. And you can contribute to this ongoingness of this program, which I will keep going no matter what. But if you do join, I do appreciate your help. And if you don't do that, get other people to subscribe and watch it. Get enlightened. Get educated. Listen, no more further words. Please welcome Karen De La Courier. Karen, good morning. Hello, Ron. Hi. Hey. So I'm just going to turn it over to you because I think you wanted to take up a subject that you've been asked a lot of questions about by many, many, many people. So over to you. Okay. This is just a quick little thing before we get into the body of the podcast. People ask me over and over again, how come normal sane people would sign a billion year contract? It just boggles the mind in people out there. And I'm going to answer this very succinctly and shortly. When you first come into the cult of Scientology, you are told man is basically good. You're a good person. You have infinite knowledge. We will make you better. And we'll take you to the point where you will have infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, infinite knowingness, infinite truth, infinite love. And then on your last day in Scientology, you are told you are evil. <laughs> you are a antisocial suppressive personality. Never mind all the 30 years of counseling we gave you were evil all along. So the story flips from you're a good being. Man is basically good to the fact that you were basically evil all along. And we didn't even know it. Wow. Boy, I'll tell you, that's a mouthful. And Karen, I got to tell you, <laughs> the briefest statement I ever heard that makes <laughs> the most truth. I'm not, well, gonna, I'm not gonna add anything to that. You said it. Thank you. Now we were going to do a whole other different topic, but free wins is the the not flavor of the month, it's the flavor of the the minute, the hour. 
people yeah. are fascinated with this story. Yeah. So we're going to get into free wins. You've been on how you've been on the ship. You were a musician. Uh, I, was, I was on the ship many times. Many, many I, times. I was on the ship on the maiden voyage. And then I went every year for many years on the maiden voyage anniversary where we would go down and it would be a week long. I was going to say festivities, but it's not really. It's a, a week of uh, brainwashing more than anything. But we would play shows about four nights out of that week. Uh, would prepare for those shows for months in advance. And they were always a flap. Everything we did as musicians was a flap. Hmm. No matter if it was good, it was a flap. And we were told by uh, one person that we were a nightmare to work with. In other words, that person could dish us orders. So what he really meant was his arm was getting tired for whipping us verbally. Hmm. And nothing we could do about it. If you're a Sea member, you say yes, sir, to a senior person. But uh, we would go to the ship every year for the anniversary. And that's that was my experience there. I could get into it, but I'd rather you get into the subject itself because I, I don't want to take this time away from you. Although if we run over, it's not a problem having you back. I'm sure you agreed to that too. Yes, of course. But, let's get into the here this thing this this measles thing there's very little being said about it and usually osa office of special affairs is they'll announce this reason you know and that reason the fastest growing religion and these guys are sps and mike rinder's no good and karen or no ron they're very vocal they're not saying anything about this. This is a bit of a mystery. This, you know, this is very, very mysterious. Yes, very mysterious. What do you call <laughs> There's the sound of silence. And media have called the cult off the hook because most media say we called and they and they had nothing. There was no comment. Now, this is beyond mysterious. Why wouldn't they want to take the opportunity of media interest to spout out a line of their enormous growth, unprecedented expansion, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> your son, David Miscavige, specifically said, you must tell the story. You must tell the narrative or the media will tell it for you so he knows and he got this from a pr firm that he hires so he knows very well that the vacuum of saying absolutely nothing is so 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 here's the thing they would rather risk the, all the theoretical hypothetical conjectures and speculation rather than just spit out what it is yeah you can only assume someone very important is on the ship well you definitely could assume that i can tell you i mean because to be silent about this and make a mystery about it just doesn't make sense to me to be honest with you karen it also they can't get their story straight they first said this was a crew member they had one free winds crew member with measles then the story changed to someone came from europe a public who had a minor cold and sniffles and this public went and had a test and it showed measles so from crew it changed to public now which story which lie does the cult want to choose today yeah and for all we know there are 10 people infected now they're absolutely stony silence we've only had the, the leak because there was evidence outside of measles who knows how many people have measles right now well i'll tell you this it's your your guess is not unfounded because the ship is very close quarters 
I yes. mean, these cabins are built right next to each other. You go in the hallway. It's not a wide hallway. And uh, people are in contact. I mean, how about the air circulation system? It's not like you're outside. You're in your cabin. And you're breathing the air that's probably being vented by other people who are con contagious. It's a small, small ship compared to the big cruise ships. I know. It's a small, compacted ship. Um, but really, Ron, this is almost karmic because the ship has been used for punishment. The ship has been used for years for imprisonment, for held against will. While Tom Cruise is dancing rock and roll up there, there's some poor girl going unconscious by being forced hard manual labor in the engine room. Yeah. And I know of several people who reported to me that they would go unconscious. Is the air in the engine room very stifling? Do you know? It, have you have you ever been punished? By I've been in the. I was sent in the bilges with the rest of the band. That air in the bilges is just contaminated with the oil smell. The temperature is probably 125, 130 degrees at least. Mm -hmm. You're talking about dealing with this bilge oil and junk down there. That mm -hmm. it, it's horrible. If there was such a place as hell, it would probably be like that. I'm not saying there isn't, but. If there were, you could imagine it to be similar to that. It's hotter than hell and stifling. And I could very well see how a person not getting enough oxygen could just pass out. It's very possible. Well, the bilges, just to define the word bilges, this is the lowest point of the ship, right? The most yeah. dirty. Yeah. Bacteria, bacteria laden, infested with remnants of God knows what. And normally in any ship, a machine cleans the bilges, not, not a human being. However, my ex-husband, Heber Jench, Guillaume, Guillaume Lerseff, Executive Director International, Mark Yeager, Watchdog Committee Chairman, uh, and Mike Rinder were, have been punished mm. by having to clean the bilges on the free winds without hazmat suits with no protection this is you see free winds was used for humiliation yeah not just punishment the cult would get away with no all this because there's no jurisdiction yeah well, the, the they very craftily uh <laughs> What is it? Set? Let me read. I, I can't recall all this. They, they, San Donato Properties of Panama purchases this ship. Then San Donato Properties is a subsidiary of Transcorp Services. Which, which is part of the Free Winds Trust, isn't it? Yes. But there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and a labyrinth here because the management of the ship is yet another. That's why <laughs> at, in the early days, the media were stumbling and bumbling and couldn't find out. They were saying alleged, alleged Scientology ship. That's because Scientology expert, the people they hire, they hire these top experts did an incredible labyrinth on the ownership of free winds. It went from here to here to here to here. So, and why would a church running a ship want to hide their identity? I'll tell you something, Ron. Yes. Free winds was never there for OT8. OT8, hogwash, hogwash, nonsense, rubbish, God swallow. OT8, the ship was purchased to funnel money. The ship was purchased to launder money. The ship, anyone who pays money on free wins, it's completely tax free. And it goes through um, people who've actually fled free wins, have talked about 
how the money shifts into free wins and out of free wins. And the cover story, Scientology lies through its teeth, is it's a religious retreat, OT8. I'd like you to give, Ron, you help me out here. You had a, a guest called George White. George White, he's the one he was on for three shows. And he talked about OT8 and about his his journey up the bridge. It, very interesting. Very I, educated person. And he knew what the hell he was talking about. Can you summarize in a paragraph what this Codswallop OT8 that George paid thousands of dollars to do? Can you please just summarize from your interviews for him in okay. a paragraph what these okay. people who paid thousands arrived at Freewinds, what did they get? What did they say? Okay, look, I guess the best analogy would be is this, that I could give you is this. Let's say you get in Scientology and you're told about these, well, miraculous things that you could achieve by achieving the top no, the top most level of spiritual enlightenment, which would be OT8. So you have this stick tied to the top of your head and in front there is a golden carrot. And this is what you are going for. Now you start going up the bridge and the more services you do, the more quote unquote enlightened you become as to how you could achieve this so that you firmly believe but you're by you doing the bridge to total freedom when you get to OT8 you're going to be able to take that golden carrot you're going to be able to exteriorize with full perception you'll have a complete memory of your whole track and well you'll have godlike powers now because this is set up as a money making scheme <laughs> Part of it is that you would go to the flag land base once every six months and they would interrogate you to see any bad things you've done. And of course, they concentrate mostly on sexual escapades. So maybe you're going to spend 20 or 30 or $40,000 a year just getting this cleanup, as they call it, before you can advance onto OT8. So after years of that and several hundred thousand dollars, you end up going to the ship to get OT8. And what you find out is this, and if, have any of you ever seen The Wizard of Oz? I'm, I'm sure most have. You go there, and when you receive that pack, and LRH, L. Ron Hubbard talking about Jesus Christ being a pedophile, and uh, L. Ron Hubbard is the Antichrist, and all this disrelated stuff that has nothing to do with you achieving these things, and at the end of this service, you find out there's more to do. That's what you achieve. You then are pulling back the curtain on the guy pulling the levers in the Wizard of Oz. You see it. And even after that, some people close the curtain and say, well, I'm going to do more because maybe there is a Wizard of Oz. That isn't a man behind the curtain pulling levers with his voice amplified and shooting steam out of various things. In other words, George White, his final conclusion was, it's bullshit. <laughs> Many people do it and still continue on. And you can see proof of this. I remember one guy came back from doing it and he says, well, now I bought all the L's and I'm thinking to myself, the L's are supposed to be like a booster rundown for anybody. After you achieve this superhuman power, why would you then need something else? Now you have the capability of going to Germany and reading a newspaper while you're sitting here in Milwaukee or in Clearwater or in Los Angeles. And so many things didn't make sense to me when I was on staff where people would go and do this and then come back and be proud that they are, they purchased their services. Is that your phone? I'm so sorry. Switched That's off. Okay. It'll be put on airplane mode. Sorry about that. That's okay. all right. That's what George concluded. And he concluded that after, and in his case, it wasn't that much, but many people spend between a couple hundred thousand up to maybe a million or two to do this. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you would achieve by going there. As a matter of fact, the first group of OTHs who went there, that was a big flap. 
they a couple he, hundred people who went. The second group, which he was part of, there was only thirty some people who went to do the service. Yeah, they've kept changing it, but this was a complete disaster. Yeah, and this is the absolute truth. This is one hundred percent true. Hubbard wrote that Jesus was a lover of young boys. Yeah, and that he was the antichrist when this first leaked to the web i thought this is just nonsense this is smearing the church but the cult themselves have verified this this was apparently attached to what's called csws at in face this this was actual cult documents so all right, so we're looking just at the, the fraud and non they, they, they've since, what they did is they studied Hubbard's, Hubbard kept solo auditing, which sounds, counseling is another word for, so he counseled himself with the e-meter for years and years and years, especially running out attached spirits. And they've called these folders, these notes he wrote, and they cooked up a cocktail of things and they've labeled this OT8 numerous times. So OT8 has been in an evolution of different editions or versions, but they got rid of the first version where Hubbard said he was the Antichrist. That, that, that's been toasted. Right. Because that caused a horrible reaction. And people, people fled Scientology forever, some of the first generation that did that. Yeah. So, so the Free Winds has been used as a punishment ship. Tony Ortega has done spectacularly well as a journalist, keeping, keeping, in fact, he broke the first suspicion of free, NBC verified it was the cult of Scientology, but Tony broke the story. And today, Tony talked about the story from which Valeska verified of a wonderful Mexican guy called Jorge Arroyo, which everyone loved. Good guy. He killed himself on Free Winds. He committed suicide. Do you know Free Winds was able to hush this up and not let the world know about it? Yes, I do know that because they are capable of doing anything in the name of the greater good of all dynamics, which means to make sure that the PR of Scientology doesn't get hurt. It has nothing to do with the greatest good, as that statement has existed in many times before Scientology. Mm. They'll do anything in the name of keeping their PR okay. Well, in a very short summary, Jorge had a big crush on a senior RTC executive. Not only was it rebuffed, but he was cruelly sent to ethics and punished and psychologically beaten up on for daring to be a lowly free wind staff member having a crush on this hierarchical high rtc rep and after the psychological beating up he got some sheets and hung himself yeah. how did they get the dead body off the ship and they lied to his parents uh, that he had. They, they per the article, they took his the body off in a black bag. Good grief. Just put it in a bag and took it off the ship like baggage, you know, like a, some bag that would be full of shoes or a person's clothes. And it just, it, it's normal. They, they, they don't yeah. think anything of it. Yeah. The, the Aftermath show with Leah did a show on another guy who hung himself in the Hollywood Inn. There's this famous building with a green vertical sign, Scientology, yeah. green sign on Hollywood Boulevard. Well, 
this guy, this young guy, Karen, Aaron Poulin, hung himself. And it boggled my mind that in a city like LA, that they could hide something, that there would be no leak at all in any media, LAPD. Yeah. Well, LAPD must be in cahoots. How can you have a suicide of a major cult in the heart of Los Angeles on Hollywood Boulevard and hide it from the world? It only ever came out on the aftermath yeah. show. Mm. It, is, so, it is incredible, isn't it? I mean, we, we talk about these things and I know sometimes I think about the interviews I'm doing with people and saying, this is almost surreal that, but it's <laughs> real. It and there's, not, there's not one politician or anybody in any influential place who does anything about it. It's yes. just ho oh, hum, you know? Yes, yes, that's a good point, Brian. Valeska, who uh, is telling, is, is, did a great interview with Tony Ortega's blog, is a must read today. Yeah. Valeska was imprisoned as a young, from a teenager for 12 years on free wings because her mother went on French TV, TV and described the level of OT3. These body thetans, these spirits attached to you, which have to be jettisoned and exorcised out of you to make you this, what Scientologists call OT. OT is uh, this high level spiritual being that can leave their body and remote view and have all this love and wisdom and truth. And they're kind of a superman, yeah. literally. You're on your way to godhood, godship, when you do what Scientology tries to sell. So Valeska was on the ship 12 years, poor baby. This is, this is held against will. This is complete kidnap. And Valeska shared with me a little, I don't know if she told Tony this, I haven't read his blog today, but she had a little cold sore, tiny pimple. She was serving Tom Cruise. And they went, I think, Miss Cavage went ballistic. And for having a cold sore, she was ordered to manually, long, long hours a day, clean in the engine room. Mm. Do you see the power they have over someone? Yeah. Your life can change in one second. This is like in the outside world, being sent to prison just arbitrarily. Somebody, a judge or somebody says, okay, you're going to prison for 12 years. They don't tell you how you can get out and there's no parole board mm -hmm. and you will get out when you're broken, when you yes. break down and are willing to say anything or obey any rule or do anything they tell you, then you're rehabilitated and you can go out in society again. This is basically what we're talking about here. You know that. Yes. I mean, yes. That, that may seem pretty rough on my part to say that, but that's no bullshit. Okay. And that's, you know, Valeska right. been there for 12 years. She can't say, well, I'm applying for parole. They say, what the fuck are you talking about? You're here, man. Yeah. You got to be interrogated every day. You got to work in the engine room until you reform, until you're rehabilitated or broken. Broken is preferred. Ron, you and I were together in this thing for 80 years. Or so. I did 40 years. You did 42 years. Um, let's examine what it is they run on you. What is it that they... What is it that the cult does when you're locked in in your stuff? They want to crush you. Yep. They want to break your spirit and make you into an obedient little robot. Yep. That's what they do with one and all. I'm not talking about public now. Public come in, spend money, get this counseling and leave. I'm talking about staff. When you are staff, the whole, the moment you make some, in staff, you're trying to just live day by day. How do you get through the next day? Yeah. <laughs>
Well, I remember telling this on one of my prior episodes. I remember going to staff meetings and I knew that we were going to get just verbally beat up. Mm. And I put myself in a position where I said to myself, I don't care what they say. I don't care anymore. In other words, I basically had to go numb to anything that was happening in order for me to tolerate that. What a hell of a state of mind. Yeah. What a hell of a state of mind. That's, that's I'm good. working my ass off every day of the week with very little privileges, if any. And to be treated this way, yeah, I tolerated it. Because you get in a state of mind that you think if you misbehave too badly, the loss, the loss of maybe someday you're achieving these superhuman or godlike powers is greater. That, that loss is greater than not towing the mark. Am I saying that correct? In other words, yes. If, yes. if I were to say something bad, I would lose that. So I don't mm -hmm. say anything bad. I tolerate it and I swallow my communication and I say, well, I've got to continue because I got to achieve that state. Well, there's, there's also this brainwashing kind of, the, the whole idea why you would suffer like this is the line is, we have such a high, high purpose. We have high ethics. Yes, we have very tough discipline. Yes, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we are just very, very tough in ethics. Yeah. Because our purpose is <laughs> the most important thing on planet Earth. We have to take over planet Earth. Yeah. We have to make planet Earth sane. And you're looking at make planet Earth sane while you act as lunatics? Yeah. It doesn't, but but you are totally told this is only because we are so important for the destiny of planet earth that we do need to be tough yeah. and we do need to carry on like this so that was part of the spiel and you think well well by then you're not even thinking straight yeah <laughs> no you're right Karen. that that so, is the state of mind you get in and uh it's the basic goodness of a person thinking that if he continues on and spread this technology every man woman and child on this planet will live better which could be nothing further from the truth than believing in that well let me tell you that day that i stood in front of the mirror and said listen i was conned that that was the moment that it, it's pretty hard to do because to spend all those years not only believing in it but getting other people to do it and recruiting people for the c organization which i did do it, it's a bitter pill to swallow and I did it and that's the only way I could turn my life around and anybody who comes out and does that they're on their way to being rehabilitated good well spoken mm -hmm. yeah so I wanted to discuss a couple of case histories to show the kidnap and um, the kidnap and punishment of free wins. Okay. There, there was a senior executive called Don Larson. Mm -hmm. And he spoke to Tampa Bay Times very much. He told this story. He was Debbie Cook's assistant, a deputy, deputy captain or deputy commanding officer, or whatever, high exec. And God knows what went wrong, but he was sick. He was coaxed into going to free wins for rehabilitation. The rehabilitation was actually locking him in a cabin with a camera on him 24 seven. He had to ask permission to go use the restroom where a security guard followed him. This, this is complete. This is who treats staff like this? Yeah. Ron, do you, do you see why it is that important that they lose tax exemption? They would yeah. never be able to get away with this yeah. if they were a business. Yeah. Business law has all kinds of rules and regulations on how you treat stuff. The reason they get away with abominable conduct is they're a religion. 
they hide and masquerade under this IRS tax exemption ruling that they're a church yeah. and a church can do anything to its stuff. It's called religious discipline. Yeah. That's the loophole in the law that must be tightened up. How cults and religions treat their stuff. Well, anyway, that, 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 has, that is true. You're saying, and I know about that. Are you going to tell how he escaped the ingenious way? Because you know, <laughs> oh, that's it's sort of technical. Well, he, I, I'll just tell you. I'll yeah, see you I, tell. See, you tell. Well, when a ship is docked, they have lines that are very heavy nylon. They must be about two two inches, two and a half inches thick, and they run from the ship down to the dock, and mm. they're held in place by these big stanchions or whatever they're called in the front of the ship and in the back of the ship. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now what Don did, Don Larson ingeniously took either a piece of wood. I think it was a piece of wood and he got a piece of PVC pipe, which yeah. was slightly bigger than the piece of wood. So that once you put it on that, maybe the wood was this big so he could hang on to each side with the hand and in the metal, was this PVC pipe that it would be similar to a rolling pin. Like if you rolled it on the table, that PVC pipe would roll and the piece of wood would stay still. Mm. And he timed this so he could do it with the least attention on him. He went over the side of the ship, put this rolling pin on the rope and let go of his legs from the bottom. And he went right down the rope, right up to the dock, jumped off at the dock, went into the ocean, climbed on the dock, and went to a taxi cab and started screaming to the guy to take him to the airport. Meanwhile, security guards came down and were screaming, he belongs on the ship. They were just going out of their fucking mind trying to get him. <laughs> and he did talk to the taxi grab driver into taking him to an airport where he didn't have his passport, but he had a driver's license and proper identification and they sold him a ticket, and that's how he got away. It was very ingenious. Because I'll tell you another thing. For you to hold on to that and go down the side of the ship, yeah. that takes some courage because that mm -hmm. is a hell of a drop to go into the, to the bay or whatever you're docked at. And he managed to go down on that thing and get out. And almost like yeah. a James Bond thing in a movie, you know? One thing the, the cult does is as soon as you arrive, they take away your passport. Yep. It's one of the first things they do. Even when you're public, they confiscate your passport. Yep. So he had no passport. Right. Uh, his passport was locked away. So he somehow convinced the airline and he got through customs and immigration. Remember, this was before 9-11. You mm -hmm. cannot get in the United States through customer without a passport. But they were a little more loosey goosey before 9 11. And he talked, he had an American voice, he had an American driver's license, but he got his flight and got into the United States with no passport. I know. And, and the triumph was he made it for Thanksgiving dinner with his mom. <laughs> he called his mom and said, Mom, is it okay if I come home for Thanksgiving dinner? No, I don't mom, know. I, I don't know this as a fact, but I heard that he his mom lived in Milwaukee. Mm, that's right. Mm -hmm. And of course I live in that area, so I'm just curious. I'm, I wonder if she's still around. Well many years ago, maybe not. Don is good friends uh with Don is good, very good friends with Amy Scobie's husband. M Matt Pesh. Matt, he and they frequently have dinner together and stuff. I know you, God, you got to get Matt Pesh on your show. I oh, have. Oh, yeah. boy, the stories he has. <laughs> Matt is terrific. Matt, so, is just, his, his attitude is like a, I don't give a shit attitude. I mean, it's just really... <laughs> refreshing to see that you know but anyway yeah. Uh, yeah. Any, any getting back to uh, don larson yeah I'd, I'd be curious to know if you actually had folks here you know well you know just think of the mindset of someone 
who is so desperate to escape yeah that they have to you know well go to that he risked his life because i don't know what the repercussions in that would be if he fell off and maybe the ship if it was a little bit rough seas went against the dock and killed him i i i don't know what the repercussions of that would be but that's not your everyday state of affairs that the average person is just going to say oh i'm going to slide down this hauser on a goddamn rolling pin come on man yeah, yeah. then the, then there's this tragic tragic story uh, one of the worst stories is the story of scott campbell and how they treated him on free winds. scott was an engineer and he was on free winds for the original purchase of the ship. And he wanted to go home because his grandma was dying. His grandma had raised him and he loved his grandma. And he ran into brick walls and they gave him black Dianetics, he calls it, which is instead of counseling, it's reverse torturous psychological bad bad stuff to cave you in mentally and he had a mental breakdown uh, i've got the whole i've got his whole story on my ch you know he he likes to be interviewed scott should tell you his breathtaking story live yeah. anyway at that time free winds had a fake doctor <laughs> a doctor that looked good on paper, but actually had no license to practice and hadn't even done the resident. You know, there, there was this fake doctor. The f yes, go ahead. Was was that was she English? Yes, British. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. I, I I remember her. Yeah, I can't, I can't can't think of her name right now, but she was having an affair, sexual intercourse with the captain who was married to someone else. I I knew that. Oh, I, I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> uh, later on, found out about it. <laughs> Anyway, the point is that she, I don't like the sound of this woman at all. She was giving Scott Campbell chloral hydrate and diazepine as a mixture, a cocktail, both of these drugs. That can kill you, you know that. Not only that, Scott did a lot of study after he left the Sea Org. It can give you long-term brain, brain injury and total memory loss yes it worses well of course the worst is it can kill you so the fake doctor who didn't know what she was doing was actually giving scott this and he lost he became a skeleton he couldn't eat he's he kind of knew they were poisoning him so he became suspicious of old food he thought that the drugs were in the food so he wouldn't eat and anyway it's a long convoluted but i'm just giving you the kind of story of what happens on free winds yeah while tom cruise is dancing upstairs and ha 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 the crew show these wonderful photo shoot things of how beautiful it is this is the kind of horror that happens just a little addendum on scott after he he went through hell and high water but guess what happened after he left and ditched scientology he was hired by a nuclear facility where you need high security clearance and he was successful and he got back his mind and he uh he triumphed and he well, uh, left uh, it uh, that's what you call change of environment that's a valid therapy get away from a bunch of criminals and you're gonna you're gonna feel better yeah and i'm sure that's what happened to scott well i'm not sure but i'm guessing because you get out of there and life is different it is not what they say it's going to be you know i i want to bring up something because i don't want to overlook this wasn't there a guy by the name of woodcraft like I mean, it was Lawrence Woodcraft. Lawrence Woodcraft yes. And he discovered that there was blue asbestos, yes. asbestos on the ship. Yes, and he did. was done about it because they couldn't find anything that LRH said about it. And that was their research. Oh, well, if L. Ron Hubbard didn't say anything about it, no problem. And it was just ignored. Yeah. 
there have been a suspicious amount of people dying of cancer, not only of free wing staff, but of OT8s who were on free wings. I think somebody did a compilation and it was like, what? They spent all that money, they went up to OT8 and they got cancer. <laughs> By the way, they also get heart attacks, strokes and diabetes and all these other things, which clearly show that their babble about how they're going to make you a superman is nonsense absolute rubbish one other very painful story is a guy called michael pattinson michael was an artist and he he started some kind of renaissance art club or society in paris and he incurred the wrath of the church who said only celebrity center paris can have a, an art society they felt he was competing with celebrity anyway there was a long-term battle michael spent over one million dollars he gave one million dollars to the cult and did everything the cult asked him to, like a good, to a very, very good artist, very successful artist. When he went to Free Wings, one of the things the cult were horrific on him was, Michael is gay. Yeah. And the cult in that, in the 1990s, they were denigrating, disparaging, looking down on you like you were some kind of freak and you got endless confessionals while they were trying to ungay or de-gay you and flush the gay out of you that was the church mentality so michael had a lot of really persecution for being gay and he he went through a little bit what Don Larson went through. They locked, <laughs> after taking a million dollars from him, they locked him in a cabin, kidnapped, locked, camera on him, watching every move. He could not escape. This was completely, this is, this is what I mean by them using lockdown and kidnap. Probably even worse than Michael's story is Cole McLaughlin, who was locked in for one year in a cabin. And that was Janet Light's husband, right? Janet Light's husband. And yeah. Janet Light was the head of the International Association of Scientologists Fund Group. What, what? Yes. It's yes. A IASI. What, what does that last thing stand for? I can't bring it to mind right now. I is I I. Well, the last, I think it ends in A, administrations, oh. I-A-S-A, yeah. uh, I-A-S administration. Janet was quite gutsy. She told your son, David Miscavige, that he was spending a lot of money on himself, gold Rolex watches and just exorbitant vacations and this and that and the other. Well, and okay. Wait, before we get into that, how about when he would go to the ship and they would rent a yacht every day yeah. for him to go out scuba diving? Scuba diving. Who paid for that? I know that yacht cost about two thousand dollars a day. Yeah. Did the IAS pay for that? Well, I obviously <laughs> I haven't seen the actual billings, but this is what Janet Light reprimanded him. And boy, you don't reprimand David Miscavige. No. no. Whoa. So she was, she and her husband, this tall Irishman called Cole McLaughlin, yeah. were summoned to, or there were about 14 to 16 CMO messengers that herded them up and hassled and got them in, in, in this building called Author Services. And then there was a huge, just, it's unbelievable. Um, Janet was jumped on 
Cole McLaughlin had three people sit on sit on his body to restrain him. He was a six foot three tall big guy. Yeah. And Cole was literally from being jumped on somehow taken to free winds. How do you take a six foot three man against his will from Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles to a ship in the Caribbean? By, I don't by changing his mind, he had to somehow snap into this position or state of mind where he thought, it's better if I go along with this and it'll work out better. I am telling you, that's the only way you could do it. Because I knew Calm. Not that I do him very well, but I met him many times. He was one tough mother. Let me tell you, it had to be they changed his mind or they broke his mind down. That's the only way they could have done it. Well, they immediately separated husband and wife. Yeah. Janet was sent to the hole. Janet was sent to this prison dungeon. The, so the hole opened in 2004. This is this nightmare prison within the hierarchical thing in base. Janet was sent to the dungeon and Cole was sent to free wing so that they were separated. And you know what Cole did? He did send, he threatened to report them to the FBI for kidnap and, and held against will. And, and he said, and he said, this is illegal. I will get out of here. I will go to the, go straight to the FBI. And the more he talked like this, the more they were <laughs> in fear that he would. So they kept, they kept him. He probably added months to his imprisonment by threatening that he would go to the FBI. For yeah. one year, this six foot three guy was locked into this a suffocating little, little cabin where he was not allowed free passage. Wow. And when I got hold of this story, I started having a voice on the internet. I didn't have a YouTube channel at the time, but I was talking, talking, talking on uh, Operation Clambake and ESMB. And I started stirring it up and I found some good Irish people who had who were ex-Scientologists and they put, we are going to the equivalent of the State Department in Ireland to get the State Department to get the next harbor master, go on the ship wherever, wherever they docked and look through every cabin and find coal. And Osa's reading all this, it got too hot. It got too hot to actually hold this guy against his will. It became, this was heat, and they let him off the ship. Look, I'm not going to take full credit for, but I did help. I stirred the pot. I made the world, in all the people that were following Scientology, I made them read, Combe is in prison in a tiny cabin on the free winds for one year. Help. Help. Yeah. And well, the Irish say, people. <laughs> if you got those Irish people to do something about it, take credit yeah. for it because that's how it happened. And that's why <clears throat> people like you or like Mike Rinder or Leah, you know, or Chris Shelton and myself, I'll, I'll count myself in that. That's the reason we do this to somehow get the word out that <clears throat> all is not well. I mean, this outfit, they're bad guys. Church of Scientology, they're, they're very bad. They will do anything to further their purpose, which is to make a lot of fucking money. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> Ronnie, we, we were bamboozled. This is this, the, the, the thuggering that occurs internally, which is all behind closed doors. Yeah. The world is only just getting a little peep inside to see when we tell these little anecdotes, what happened. But look at the purpose of the ship. That ship was bought mm -hmm. for money funneling reasons. Yeah. Right? That's exactly right. It wasn't done for the purpose they said it was done so that you could audit this high level OT level away from land mass. Mm -hmm. That was the original. Yeah. You remember yeah. that? Yeah. In other words, you had to do this away from the land mass and that, that's the only way you could achieve it. And that's why they had to get a ship, which was 
a short story. In other words, a lie. That's <laughs> a famous thing in Scientology. Uh, they have what they call a short story. In other words, it's an acceptable truth. That is a lie. <laughs> well, uh, they even changed the word lie. They changed the definition to acceptable truth. Yeah, acceptable truth is any lie you tell, which is for the good of Scientology. You can lie through your teeth. It's not a lie. It's an acceptable truth. I know. <laughs> I know. That is. And did we finish off with the blue asbestos? What? I, didn't that come to a head years later? So they started removing it. It. I, I don't know if we got fully into how they handled that. Did we? I, I don't know all my facts of that. I do know that in some third world country port, they were trying to do something and there were some adverse. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but we can almost do a part two on free winds. There's a lot more stories. And I'd like to get into the asbestos at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, because I'll tell you what, we're, how many minutes do we have, Sean? We got five minutes. There's no way we're going to get into other stuff in five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I, as much as I'd love to continue on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's the rules here. Well, not the rules, but it's the, the house rules. Let's put it that way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, anyway, listen, stay tuned and I will announce when Karen's going to be on next. But meanwhile, uh, all of you who are watching this, uh, if you'd like to become patrons, please do so because that definitely helps the ongoingness of this show because we don't have sponsors, so we can do whatever we want to do, which is to enlighten you and no holds barred. Come here. You're going to hear the truth. So be become a patron. Go to the real Ron dot com or well, not or let's say and get other people to subscribe to watch these shows anyway. Uh, Wow, I hate the hell, I hate like hell to end off, but we've got to. So stay tuned. I'll let you know when we'll be on next. Karen, thank you very much for coming on. And I'll be in touch with you after the show. We can line up the next one, okay? My pleasure, Ron. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Ron. Bye bye, audience. Bye bye. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. And I'll see you on the next episode. Bye bye for now.